Father and God, how grateful we are for all that you've given to us. Most importantly, that you gave us your darling son, Jesus, to die on the cross of Calvary. And beyond that, O oh God, you've given us the gift of your Holy Spirit to dwell within us, to guide us, to strengthen us, to lead us into righteousness. We embrace and celebrate that Holy Spirit today and ask him not only to be present, but God, to break through into every secret area of our lives. If there be anything in us, O oh God, that is contrary to your willing, your word, Holy Spirit, come now and have thy work upon us. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to stand and speak for you. Won't you take my head and my heart? Won't you anoint my mind and my mouth? Oh God, allow there be no gap between your will and my words. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In the blessed name of Jesus, our Christ, we do pray. Amen. Amen. Today, as was mentioned, is Pentecost Sunday where we acknowledge and examine the work, the moving, the coming of the Holy Spirit into the life of the church and the life of believers. Here's a pop quiz for you. If you really want to talk about Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit, there is but one book of the Bible you'll find that in. It's not Matthew. It's not Mark. It's not Genesis, but it's what? What book do we go to? Amen. Someone's been in Sunday school. The book of Acts the Acts of the Apostles, and as you're turning to the second chapter of the book of Acts, I want to welcome Brother Brian Woolfolk, who's with us today. He's running for a seat in Maryland in the Senate seat. Brother Brian, welcome to Alpha Street today. We pray God's blessings upon you and welcome you to our church family. Once you've navigated yourself to the second chapter of the book of Acts, either on your smart device or in your Bible, would you please stand with us that together we might reverence the reading of God's holy word from Acts chapter 2. The second chapter of the book of Acts, as we re hear the record of the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1, reading this morning from the New King James Version of God's Holy Word. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we are born? Parthians and Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, they are full of new wine. I want to talk and teach from the topic today, the power of Pentecost. You may be seated in the presence of God. The power of Pentecost. For those who may be unfamiliar, when you go to the New Testament and you see how the books are ordered and laid out and structured, those who placed the canon together had a reason for placing books in the New Testament in the order in which they are placed. For example, the letters of Paul are given to us not chronologically by date, but rather by length. 
and the reason Galatians precedes Philippians is because Galatians is longer. And so the Pauline letters are ordered based upon their length. The book of Revelation is put at the end because obviously it deals with end time things. The Gospels open up the New Testament because they introduce us to the main character of the New Testament and of our faith, Jesus our Christ. Matthew is the first gospel in your Bible because Matthew, unlike any of the others, gives us a more detailed description of the birth of Jesus Christ, the beginnings of his life, and therefore Matthew begins the New Testament. There are scholars, though, who would argue if you look at the layout of the gospels, that there's something out of order in separating the gospel of Luke from the book of Acts. James, there are those who would argue, and maybe rightfully so, that Acts ought to be consecutively placed right next to Luke. For if one reads, you'll find the same writer of the gospel of Luke is the writer of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And this Luke, after he pens his gospel and tells us the story of the earthly ministry of Jesus, then takes another scroll of parchment and puts pen to parchment yet again to give us the story of the Acts of the Apostles to remind us that the good news of Jesus Christ does not stop with the earthly ministry of Jesus. Luke writes the Acts of the Apostles to remind us that after Christ has been resurrected from the dead, there's still work to be done. And that good news will be shared by these uh, disciples who now become apostles whom we read about in the Acts of the Apostles. And so Acts is really the second part of the Gospel of Luke. In Acts, we read about Peter and his powerful preaching that lead some 8,000 souls to be converted to the way, the movement of Jesus Christ. We read about the sacrificial martyrdom of men like James and Stephen who surrender their lives to the cause of Christ. We hear about the transformation, the conversion of the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus and how in three separate journeys he travels around the Greco-Roman Mediterranean world preaching the good news of our Lord and our Savior. In the book of Acts, we hear and see these doctrinal debates about the circumcision of Gentiles as a prerequisite and necessity for being saved and how those doctrinal debates shaped and formed early Christian theology. And what is important to note is that the gospel writer Luke wants to show that there is continuity and connectivity between the ministry of Christ and the mission of the church. And so he pins the Acts of the Apostles to let us know that it didn't end with Jesus Christ, but rather that there is a connection that is found in chapters 1 and 2 of the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost. That Pentecost is the day, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when the Holy Spirit comes, and it is that day that links the church to its Christ. And so Luke, unlike Matthew, unlike Mark, and unlike John, knows that the gospel story is not just that he came, he lived, he died, and he rose again. No, Luke understands that the gospel goes like this. He came, he lived, he died, he rose, he ascended to heaven, the Holy Spirit came down, and he's coming back again. Let me pause, rewind, make sure you get that. He lived He came, he lived, he died, he rose, he resurrected, he ascended to heaven. The Holy Spirit came down, and he's coming back again. And and Luke, much like Paul, understands the critical nature of the Holy Spirit for the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ, the life of a believer, and the work of the church. That just as God 
shaped Adam out of the dust of the earth, but Adam did not become a living being until God breathed his ruach into him, his spirit, which calls him to come alive. So too did Jesus Christ shape and form the church and pay for it with his blood, but it was not until the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came to breathe into the church that it became a living entity and organization. It took the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And I suggest to you, my brothers and my sisters, that the Holy Spirit in contemporary Christianity gets a bad rap. Because when you hear the word Pentecost, your first instinct is to think Pentecostal. And when you hear the word Pentecostal with your good Baptist ears. <laughs> A whole other set of images and ideologies pop into your head. For most of us, when we hear the term Pentecostal, maybe you think of some rural areas in Kentucky where they handle snakes and are not bitten. Most of us who spend any amount of time in African-American Christianity, when you hear Pentecostal, you get a whole other set of images in your head. When you hear Pentecostal, you, 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 you might think of worship services that last <laughs> a mighty long time. When some of us hear Pentecostal, we have an image of women with white doilies on their heads, wearing stockings so thick you can't see through them. When you hear Pentecostal, may, maybe your mindset goes back to that experience you had with a relative when you went to Pentecostal church and they shouted from the call to worship to the benediction. When you hear Pentecostal, maybe you envision folk who exercise their faith by taking laps around the sanctuary. When you hear Pentecostal, may, 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 maybe your envisionment is folk coming to the altar and preachers laying hands on them and at, at a magical touch, they fall out. And you know you're at a good Pentecostal church they not only have hymnals and Bibles, but sheets on the side so that when the sisters are falling out at the altar, we cover them with sheets so their private blessings won't be seen. When you hear Pentecostal, more than likely, what pops into your mind is speaking in tongues. Because there are those in the Pentecostal side of our faith who would argue to you that you are not filled with the Holy Spirit if you don't speak in tongues. As a matter of fact, I would suggest to you that the Holy Spirit is probably most, one of the most divisive doctrines in contemporary Christianity are those who embrace the full manifestations of gifts and speaking in tongues and charismatic worship. And then there are some of us on the more conservative side who stray away and are a little adverse to what we say when we say the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, here's how I can tell if you got some Pentecostal in you. You ready? Is it the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost? If... if if you are Holy Ghost, you got some Pentecostal in you somewhere. Oh, but if he's the Holy Spirit, you are on the conservative side of Pentecostalism. I remember growing up in a very straight, conservative, old school Baptist church where we did not embrace all of the workings of the Holy Spirit. And I'll never forget as a child, there was a sister one day while the pastor was praying at altar call, she stood at the altar and she began praying in tongues. Nobody said anything then, but it was on the next church meeting agenda. <laughs> and she was not asked, she was not voted out, but she was asked to leave. 
because we did not embrace nor condone speaking in tongues. As a matter of fact, anyone who knows anything about denominations will understand that the whole full gospel Baptist church movement led by Paul Morton was simply an attempt of the Baptist church to be more embracing of the Pentecostal nature of the Holy Spirit and its outworkings in the Baptist church, which up until then had strayed away from an embracing of what the Holy Spirit had come to do. It is divisive in our doctrine of the Holy Spirit. There are those who shy away and there are those who judge your walk with the Lord by how much of the Holy Spirit you exhibit and exemplify in worship. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? How do you know if someone has the Holy Ghost? What criteria do you use? To understand if that's the Holy Spirit or not. As a matter of fact, since we're getting to know one another, would you just nudge your neighbor, look him in the eye and ask him, do you have the Holy Spirit? <laughs> now, 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 if your neighbor said yes, look him back and say, prove it. Prove, prove, prove. <laughs> how, how do you know when the Holy Spirit is at work? How can you tell? I think as good Baptists, we ought to examine some scripture this morning to help us understand what Pentecost and the Holy Spirit is all about, lest we be judged prematurely based upon one thing, which is the speaking in other tongues. Because I would suggest to you early in this sermon that speaking in tongues is not the only exhibit and exemplification of the Holy Spirit's presence in the church and in my life. How do you know? Well, I suggest we look at Scripture, and here in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit has come, Jesus says we receive power. What is the power of Pentecost? I want to invite you to journey with me this morning to look at the prerequisite of Pentecost power, the purpose of Pentecost power, the particularity of Pentecost power, and the peculiarity of Pentecost power. Can we do that? Can we look at the prerequisite, the purpose, the particularity, and the peculiarity of Pentecost? And maybe we'll leave this place with a better understanding of whether we've got the Holy Spirit or not. I'll suggest to you, first of all, that there is a prerequisite for Pentecost power. Danny, watch what the Bible says. The Bible says that when the day of Pentecost had fully come, that they were all gathered together in one place, and on one accord. Paul, stop right there. Before you get to speaking in tongues, before you get to laying hands on folk and them falling out at the altar, before you take a lap around the sanctuary, the Bible says that in order for the Holy Spirit to come, those who had gathered together were all in one place and all gathered under one accord. Now you have to ask yourself, why are they gathered? Well, you must remember that Jesus has given them the commandment to wait and pray until they receive the promise that God had given to them that the Holy Spirit would come. And so these disciples are gathered together waiting and praying. But note something different and difficult here. If you go back to chapter 1, verse 15, you'll find that Luke tells us how many are gathered together waiting and and praying. If you still have your Bibles open, chapter 1, verse 15 simply says this, that 120 of them are gathered together waiting and praying. How many are gathered together? 120. You're good Bible students. You must understand that that is not a random number. That is not some number that's just a multiplication of 12. That number has significance in Jewish culture. For you will find under the Jewish religious laws that it took 120 men gathered together to establish a valid synagogue. Oh, don't you miss this. If you had 119, you weren't a valid worship experience. But if you had 120, 
you could deem yourself a synagogue to handle the business of God and worship God. And so what is gathered together here is not just some random grouping of disciples, but enough to establish the formality of a religious institution that could worship God and be about the business of God. This was not just some happenstance, but this was something valid in the eyes of God based upon the number of men gathered together to be deemed worthy of worship and doing the work of God. 120 meant there was some formality there. And the Holy Spirit waits until enough have gathered together to establish a collective community that could worship and be about the work of God while they were waiting and praying and then the Holy Spirit shows up. Don't you miss this? The Holy Spirit showed up in a collective community. Notice, Laura, the Holy Spirit did not just pick out 12 and show up. The Holy Spirit didn't just find Brother Peter by himself or Sister Mary all by herself. That when the Holy Spirit showed up, the Holy Spirit did not pick individuals. The Holy Spirit descended on the body of believers that were legally and formally created to worship and be about the work of God while they waited and prayed. I'm trying to suggest to you that the coming of the Holy Spirit was not at first an individual experience, but a communal one. And that maybe, just maybe, the primary purpose of the coming of the Holy Spirit is not about your individual gift. It's not about speaking in tongues. Not about shouting and running through church. It's not about passing out at the altar. But the Holy Spirit comes to connect and commit you in covenant to a family of faith called the church. You, 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 you want to show me You've got the Holy Spirit, join a church, and stay at that church. Okay, 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 okay. You, you, you missed it. It is the Holy Spirit that locks you into your body of faith. It is the Holy Spirit that draws you to your church family. It is the Holy Spirit that moves on your life and makes you stay connected to the body of Christ where you've been called to worship. So... It's the Holy Spirit that makes you stay when church gets unpleasant. It's the Holy Spirit that makes you pray rather than gossip when you hear that trouble is brewing within the body of Christ. It is the Holy Spirit that makes you get up on Sunday morning and press and push your way to the house of God because you know you owe it to God to be in his house and to worship him. It's the Holy Spirit. Watch, watch this. You really want to see the Holy Spirit? Not in a sanctuary. Go to Overflow and find folk who, even though they didn't get in the main sanctuary, they decided that they weren't going to leave. They weren't going to get in their car. They were going to stay right there because God has called them to worship in this house. You, 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 you show me a saint that doesn't come to church on Sunday. And I'll show you a saint that's not filled with the Holy Spirit. You show me a saint who's always critical, always negative, always got something ugly to say, church too long, church too short, he was too loud, he was too quiet, they got on my nerves, the choir didn't sound good, wasn't no parking, ushers were mean, greeters didn't smile, my neighbor got on my nerves, and I'll show you one who doesn't have the Holy Spirit. Show me a member who resigns their membership the first time they don't get what they want and we didn't paint the bathroom the color you voted on and so now you're going to go try to find another church and I'll show you one who doesn't have the Holy Spirit. Show me a believer who moves from this church to that church to that church to this church and hops every time church doesn't turn out the way they want and I'll show you a believer who doesn't have the Holy Spirit. Because the very first working of the Holy Spirit is to bring you into one place 
And watch what the Bible says. Don't miss this. And in one accord. You know that term one accord, that means so much more, Dean Johnson, than just being in the same building. One accord doesn't mean we just go to the same church. One accord means that there's some commonality of our thought, that there's some unity in our vision, that there's some love in the membership, that there's some relationship that keeps me, that we see the same. We are worshiping together. We are in love with each other, that we are about the same business for the church, that we are in one accord. And that maybe the real sign of the Holy Spirit is the unity in the pew. Well, well, now, 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 watch this. Let me tell you why it's important. Because when I first came to Alexandria, and the Lord called me here to pastor Al Street Baptist Church, I was outside one day, and I met a member uh, who used to, excuse me, a sister who used to be a member, and we began talking. She identified herself as a former member of Alfred Street. And so I asked her, I said, well, why are you a former member? Why do you no longer go to church? And I thought she was going to give me the answer that I'd heard about Alpha Street, you know, that I was expecting her to say, well, you know, there, there's a socioeconomic strata at Alpha Street that uh, makes some people feel, un y'all know who you were before I got here, you, you remember who you were, <laughs> that, that, you know, you, you had to fit a certain bill to, to feel like you belonged, and that's what I was expecting her to say, but that, that's not what she said. Here's why she says she's no longer a member of Alpha Street. Watch this, she said, because y'all don't catch the ghost enough. Now, 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 let me tell you, if you ain't Pentecostal, you don't even know what she was talking about. <laughs> she, she said, y'all don't catch the ghost. She was referring to there's a problem in our pneumatological worship and liturgical experience where we did not become charismatic in our expressions of the gift of God. In other words, y'all don't shout enough, y'all don't stand up enough, y'all don't wave your hand enough, y'all don't get on the organ and do a war cry enough, y'all don't run around the church enough, ain't nobody passed out at the altar. So in her mind, there's no Holy Spirit in the church uh, because you all don't stand, you don't shout, you don't run, you don't do the things that I look for as evidence of the Holy Spirit. And I said, that's fine, sister, but allow me to tell you something, that the real presence of the Holy Spirit is not found in how people worship on Sunday morning. If the truth be told, any Anybody can wave on Sunday. Anybody can say amen on Sunday. If you want to see if there's Holy Spirit in the church, you got to find out if they're on one accord. You won't see that in worship. Oh, but if you want to see if a church has the Holy Spirit, show up at the church business meeting and see how members talk to one another. If you want to see the Holy Spirit, bug the boardroom and tape the conversations between trustees and deacons and the pastor to see if there's really some Holy Spirit. If you want to see the Holy Spirit, Show up at choir rehearsal and see what happens when two altos want the same tenor. If you want to see the Holy Spirit, go to the parking lot after worship and see how members interact with each other after they're out of the church. That's where you really see if there's some Holy Spirit. It's not about how loud we shout. But are we together in one place, on one accord? And I suggest to you that that is the reason why the enemy continues to try to create diversity and division within the body of Christ. Because wherever we are divided, there can be no full manifestation of the Holy Spirit to empower us to the work that we've got to do. Can I preach it like I'm the pastor? I'm just going to say what God put on my heart. That's why Paul says you got to look out for troublemakers. Look out for dividers. Look out for those who speak ill of your leadership. Look out for those who are always running their mouth about another church member. Look out for those who are always critical because in their divisive spirit, they are blocking the Holy Spirit, which would come and empower the church for the work that God has called them to do. Hey, baby, if they can't get on one accord, you need to move away from them. If they can't speak in love, you need to switch your seat. If they can't be supportive of the vision, you need to move out of their presence because they are blocking the Holy Spirit's work in the church. Now, if your neighbor is quiet, <laughs> nudge them, say, you just told on yourself. You just, he, he says there's a prerequisite for Pentecost power, but not only that, there's a purpose for Pentecost power. Why do we receive the Holy Spirit? 
Why does God grant us the gift of his spirit to dwell within us? Now, let me tell you that that's a divisive question in Christianity because there are those on the extreme side of Pentecostalism who use the gifting and presence of the Holy Spirit as a badge of spiritual bravado by which they can judge other people. And so I'm Holy Ghost filled if I do such and such and such, and there's something wrong with you and your church if you don't. Why do we receive the Holy Spirit? Now, there's some that argue that the reason we receive it and the way we signify we have him is through the speaking of tongues, which I understand is one manifestation, but I've got a problem. You can't tell me that speaking in tongues is the only way to prove that I have the Holy Spirit because when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River by John, the Holy Spirit descended upon him, and nowhere did he talk in tongues. Well, some would argue with you, and I want you to be certain you're ready to deal with your Pentecostal brethren and sisters who would tell you, well, no, in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came, the Bible says they spoke in other tongues. Yes and no. I'll suggest to you that when you do your homework and really read Acts chapter 2 correctly, that what you see happening here in Acts chapter 2 has not happened again since this moment. The speaking in tongues that you hear about in Acts chapter 2 is not the glossolalia that Paul speaks about when he writes to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 14 about them being out of order and having tongues but no interpretation. That's not the same tongues. As a matter of fact, the tongues you hear here are not the same tongues that Paul writes about in Romans chapter 8 when he says that when we pray, this Holy Spirit makes his intercessions for us with groanings and mutterings because we do not know how to pray as we ought to. You need to read your Bible. That's not the tongues that Paul is talking about that we see here in Acts chapter 2. If you read here in Acts chapter 2 correctly, here's what it says, that when the Holy Spirit rested upon them like cloven tongues of fire and they all began to speak, the Bible says that they spoke in other languages. So much so that in Acts chapter 2, verse 6 and verse 11, there are those gathered from other places who say, listen, we're hearing these men and women speak in the language in which we were born. Watch it. So here's what really happens in Acts chapter 2. Galileans who've not been trained speak in other known languages that they've never learned. So it's like all of a sudden, it's like all of a sudden, Joe begins to speak in German, and he's never taken a German class. It's like all of a sudden, the sister next to you begins to speak in Spanish, and she's never had a Spanish class. That they began to speak in other known languages of the world. Now, why does the Holy Spirit enable them to speak in languages that are known around the world, but they've not been trained in. Here it is, because in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus declared that when the Holy Spirit will come upon you, you will receive power, not to talk in glossolalia, and not just to lay hands on people, and not just to have charismatic worship, but you will receive power to be my witnesses to the uttermost ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit is going to equip you to go into areas you've never been in and preach the gospel in languages that you've never even knew you could speak because I need the world to know that what I have done is available to everyone and in order to speak to them you got to know how to speak their language and so they speak the language of the Cyrenians because they're going to Cyrene they can speak the language of Pamphylia because they're going to Pamphylia. They can speak the language of Arabic because they're going into the Arab nations. And it is a manifestation of the fulfillment of the promise of Jesus that you would be able to preach the gospel in the entire world. So here it is. What is the primary purpose of Pentecost power? Not to talk in tongues. Not to lay hands on folk, but to equip us for evangelism. That the primary purpose of the Holy Spirit in your life is to cause you to live a life that draws other people to the cross of Jesus Christ. You read in Acts chapter 2, when they began, watch Bible study, when they began to speak in these other tongues, the Bible says that those who were outside the church were attracted in great multitude to see what was going on because when they were under the gifting of the Holy Spirit, their lives attracted others. 
primary purpose of the Holy Spirit is to cause you to be evangelical in your living. To be a witness of Jesus Christ. You show me a saint who never speaks about Jesus Christ. And I'll show you one who's not guided by the Holy Spirit. And then you show me a sister who goes to her job every day. And tells folk how good God has been. And prays with people. And is not ashamed to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. And I will show you a sister that is walking under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so... Sister says, y'all don't catch the ghost because you don't run enough. You don't shout loud enough. You don't fall out at the altar. All right, that's one way. But please know that you should not judge the Holy Spirit's presence by how loud folks shout. You ought to judge his presence by how many folk are being drawn. And so may maybe Alfred Street doesn't shout loud enough. Maybe people don't take laps like you want to see them. And maybe we don't have sheets to cover folk when they pass, if they pa never pass out at the altar. <laughs> but last night, we baptized 21 new believers into the body of Christ. And a few weeks ago, 64 people joined church in one weekend. Now, I don't know where else I can prove that the Holy Spirit is at work. The Bible says they heard it in their own language. Watch how the Holy Spirit works and how you can see his presence. That people who were gathered, no matter where they had come from, they got a word. They could hear it was relevant to them. They could receive it. So here's how you really know the Holy Spirit is at work in a church. When people can come from different places and backgrounds and experiences and still find relevance in the house of God. So if a brother with braids and tattoos over every inch of his body can walk in the church and hear the word of God and feel the love of God and find relevant ministry, the Holy Spirit is at work. If somebody that just found out they're HIV positive can come in and you still share the peace and the love of God with them, then the Holy Spirit is at work. Uh, if that sister who just got out of jail can get back in the house of God and not be judged but be encouraged to get her life back on track, then the Holy Spirit is at work. Uh, if that single mother can find somebody who says, I'll help you if the baby daddy ain't around, then the Holy Spirit is at work. If that father whose son just said he's gay, find somebody who can pray with him, then the Holy Spirit is at work. Because I can hear it no matter where I've come from. There's a prerequisite for Holy Spirit. There's a purpose for the Holy Spirit. But watch this. Watch the particularity of Pentecost power. Watch this, saints. Pop quiz. How many people were gathered together? Thank you, Jesus, 120. And the Bible says in verse number six that when the Holy Spirit landed, it landed differently upon each one of them so that they all began to speak in different languages. Watch this. So when the Holy Spirit comes and lands on Deacon V, the way the Holy Spirit filled Deacon V is different than the way the Holy Spirit filled Juanita, right? So Juanita speaks in one way, Deacon V speaks in another, but it's the same Holy Spirit. <laughs> so, so the Holy Spirit filled Tom in a way that caused him to say something, but then the Holy Spirit filled Deacon Morrison in a different way that caused him to speak something, and what they said didn't sound the same, but they were both filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't you miss this. So when the Holy Spirit makes his presence known, everyone doesn't respond the same way. Here's the depth of it. There's no homogeneity in the Holy Spirit. Pastor, for real. <laughs> All right, you know, I share with the early churches, which you know this, that when I stand to preach the word of God, God has put certain 
guide so my heart for what I'm trying to do. Whenever I preach, I'm trying to draw you to your Bible so you'll understand the word of God more. I'm trying to open your eyes to global consciousness. I'm trying to di have you dig deep into doctrine, and I'm trying to use a big word to enlarge your vocabulary. Whenever, amen, I'm beyond, whenever I preach, I want you to need a Bible, a newspaper, and a dictionary. That I believe that one of the signs that we are growing congregations that we have an expansive vocabulary. Ah, so there is no homogeneity in the Holy Spirit, which means that everything is not homogenous. Pastor, that's the same word. That's not fair. That simply means that everything doesn't look the same. Everyone doesn't act the same. That the presence of the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that everybody has to have the same thing coming out of their mouths. That when I'm filled, what comes out of my mouth can be different than what comes out of your mouth. And when I'm filled, I don't have to say the same things that you say. And just because you say it this way doesn't mean that I'm not filled because I say it a different way. So watch this. Here's how you can sense the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit fills and there is acceptance of diversity of manifestation so that I don't judge you if you don't respond to him the same way I do. Can I preach this? Watch, watch. The Bible says that when the Holy Spirit came, they began to speak. And although they were speaking different languages, they were all, verse 11, talking about the wonderful works of God. So that when sister over there got filled and began thinking about the wonderful works of God, how she responded was different than brother right there when he began to think about the wonderful works of God. And that was different than him up there when he began to think about the wonderful works of God. So what shows the Holy Spirit is that when I begin to think about the wonderful works of God, you grant me the freedom to respond as the Holy Spirit would lead me without judging me based upon how you respond to the Holy Spirit. Can I preach this thing? Here's how you can see the Holy Spirit. When on each pew, there's room for you to shout if that's what you want to do. And I can sit if that's what I want to do. And I not judge you and you not judge me for how we respond to the Holy Spirit. If you want to run and I want to sit quiet, that's all right. If you want to stand and I want to cry, that's all right. You do you and let me do me. And that's how we know the Holy Spirit is at work. Can I just pause for a moment and encourage you just to, when you think about the wonderful works of God, to just go and let the Holy Spirit do in you what you want to do. If you want to stand, stand. If you want to shout, shout. If you want to run, take a lap. If you want to sit, sit. But just respond as the Spirit leads you. Everybody doesn't have to respond the same way. There's no homogeneity in the spirit. There's a prerequisite, we be in one accord. There's a purpose, equip us for evangelism. There is a particularity, we have diversity in how we respond. But watch this last one, there is a peculiarity of Pentecost power. When the Holy Spirit comes, and fills these 120 believers. The Bible says that there were some standing outside who said they are full of new wine. Now, in case your sanctification doesn't allow you to translate that correctly, <laughs> there were those who said, these folk have been drinking now, now, if you keep on reading, I want to just teach Bible. When you keep on reading, when Peter gets up to defend them, this is what Peter says. They haven't been drinking. It's too early. <laughs> you get that when you get home. No, I hope you don't get that when you get home. Uh, he, he, it's, it's, it's just too early. But here's the point. There were those who saw them at 9 a.m. in the morning, 
and knew something was different about him. So here it is. That really, they looked at him and wondered, why are y'all so happy at 9 a.m.? And could the real sign of the Holy Spirit in your life not be whether you talk in tongues and run around the church and lay out at the altar? Could it be your demeanor and your disposition early in the morning? If you wake up grumpy and ugly every day, you might not have the Holy Spirit. If you go to work cantankerous and mean all the time, you might not have the Holy Spirit. Folk who are filled with the Holy Spirit can wake up in the morning and know that it's going to be a rough day. But before they get their day started, something begins to move in their spirit and says, this is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. As a matter of fact, can I just take a poll of the house? Is there anybody who woke up this morning with some joy in your heart? Is there anybody that just woke up and you were glad to be alive? Is there anybody that woke up and you were thankful that this was a day you could come and worship God? There's something about waking up with joy and peace and happiness that says the Holy Spirit is in my life. They noticed that something was different. P please tweet this correctly. This is deep. This is so deep. I'm going to make sure you get it. This is deep. It's deep. You ready? The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to make you holy. <laughs> to make you different. To make you talk differently, walk differently, live differently. If you blend in in every environment, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't you know what Paul says? That God has shaped us to be a peculiar people. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. That God has called us out of darkness. God has commanded us to let go of the unclean things. And God calls us to live our lives in such a way that people see we are different. And let me tell you, you can't see that on Sunday morning in 90 minutes. In worship, everybody can act holy. I mean, you got enough good sense not to show your true self in church. You act saved in church. So I can't really tell if you've got the Holy Spirit in church. If you want to know if you have the Holy Spirit, you need to look at not your life in the sanctuary, but your life in the streets. Are you peculiar? Are you holy? Are you strange? Or do you just blend in with every environment? You know, I'm a sports fan, and one of the things I like to do, um, I keep up with the latest going on in sports. I get up in the morning, I want to listen to my routine. I get up, I pray, I get a cup of coffee, and I put on Sports Center. That's, that's my regular routine. I need to know what's happening in the sports world. I need to know that. And this past week, <laughs> this past week, you all know that one of the topics that dominate the airwaves was that Colin Kaepernick, the quarterback for I don't know if she's clapping because he's handsome or he's a good quarterback. Uh, but Colin Kaepernick, the quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers, received a new contract, making him one of the top 10 highest paid quarterbacks in the league. He's paid at the same level of Aaron Rodgers and Drew Brees and Tom Brady and Tony Romo. He's paid. And the whole debate this week was whether or not Colin Kaepernick is worthy of the salary he's getting. And so the debate centered on some of his statistics, kind of gauging him with some of the great quarterbacks. And so as part of that, 
Chris, they, they debate things like Super Bowl rings and how many Tom Brady has and how Colin Kaepernick doesn't. They look at things like interceptions and turnovers, touchdowns. One of the things they measure and use to gauge quarterbacks is called passing yards. How many yards has the quarterback thrown for in a given season? And as they began talking about Colin Kaepernick's passing yards, which were very high, one of the commentators on Mike and Mike in the Morning said, listen, those numbers are inflated because anyone who knows football knows that a quarterback's passing yards are not accurate because a quarterback can be on the 20-yard line, throw the ball to a receiver at the 25-yard for five yards, but if that receiver can run to the end zone another 75 yards, the quarterback is given 75 passing yards, even though he only threw it five yards. You all with me? And so they are arguing that what you have to do with certain quarterbacks is subtract from their passing yards an acronym called YAC, Y-A-C, teach pass to us, YAC, <laughs> yards after catch. And so if Kaepernick only throws five, but bold and run 75, they said this, there's a difference between how far he threw it and how far the receiver ran after he caught it. Right. That what matters is not simply when he caught it, but of how far he ran after he caught it. You, you'll catch it. It's not when you catch it. It's how far you run after you catch it. Are you still a little slow? It's not how much Holy Ghost you catch on Sunday, but it's how far you run on Monday and how you live on Tuesday and how you love folk on Wednesday and how you forgive folk on Thursday and how you worship God on Friday. It's not whether you caught the Holy Spirit. It's how far you ran after you received the Holy Spirit that the real measure of the Holy Spirit is not what you do in this sanctuary. It's how you live in the street. And so I've been telling people this, the next time, the next time someone looks at you and has the audacity to ask you if you have the Holy Spirit, the next time you run up on your Kojic cousin and, <laughs> and they ask you, do you have the Holy Spirit? Your answer should be no. I don't have the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit has me. He controls my mind and my mouth and my desires. I don't control the Spirit. The Spirit controls me. I don't have him, but I'm praying that every day he has me. The prerequisite is that we're on one accord. You want to show me the Holy Spirit? Show me your commitment to your church. The purpose is that we become evangelical. You want to show me the Holy Spirit? Show me lives you've sown the good news of Jesus Christ into. You want to show me you have the Holy Spirit? Show me that you can accept people worshiping and responding differently than you do and not judge whether they are filled or not. You want to show me you have the Holy Spirit? Show me that you're different, that you don't blend in, that you stand out. And it's not just about how you shout on Sunday, but how you live and come Thursday. Do you have the Holy Spirit?